Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Russell Higgins and I'm the chairman of Argo Investments Limited. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I'm pleased to welcome you to the 78th Annual General Meeting of the company and to report on its operations and financial results for the year ended 30 June 2024. It's pleasing to be able to meet here in person once again and I see many of our shareholders uh, and a number of visitors are here this morning, so very welcome. Before we begin, begin the formalities, I'd like to inform you that the meeting is being filmed and streamed live to the company's website. A recording of the meeting will also be available on our website later in the day. Can I please ask you to turn your phones to silent? I've already done mine this year. Other years I've had to check, but I did it before. So. I've been informed by the company secretary that the meeting has been convened in accordance with the Opera uh, Corporations Act and with the company's constitution. A quorum is present and therefore I declare the meeting open. A disclaimer is displayed uh, before you there on the screen and it's important to understand that the information presented today is general information only and is not a securities recommendation or statement of opinion intended to influence any person uh, in making an investment decision. You should consider seeking professional advice before making any major investment decision. I'm pleased to ask my fellow non-executive directors and our managing director and company secretary to introduce themselves this morning. Leanne. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Leanne Buck. I joined the board of Argo in 2022 and I'm the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. I'm standing for re-election today, so you'll hear more from me later. And good morning on this beautiful Adelaide morning. My name is Chris Cuff. I've been on the board since 2016 and I'm also on the Audit uh, and Risk Committee. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Holzberger. I joined the Argo Board in, uh, last year in 2023, and I'm also on the uh, Remuneration Committee. Uh, good morning. My name is Liz Lewin. I was appointed to the Board in 2018. Um, and I'm a member of the Remuneration Committee. Um, I'm also up for a re-election today, so you'll hear from me a little bit later on as well. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, great turnout again. Uh, my name is Jason Beto. I'm the Managing Director of Argo. Been with the company since 2001, so it's amazing how quickly that's uh, gone. And uh, I look forward to uh, you know, speaking to you a little later. Uh, good morning. I'm Tim Banks. I'm the Company Secretary. I'm uh, a baby at Argo compared to Jason, 2007 I joined, um, and I'm also Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. Unfortunately, Peter Warren is unable, uh, who's a non-executive director, is unable to join us here today. Peter's at home with very limited mobility, recovering from a recent foot operation. Peter joined the board in 2022 and is chair of our remuneration committee. Peter's watching online and we wish him a speedy recovery. I'll now move on to the meeting procedures. All resolutions at this AGM will be decided by poll. As chairman, I have called that poll. When registering your attendance, you will have received either a green, pink or white admission card. Shareholders or proxy holders representing shareholders were issued with a green admission card and are entitled to vote on the poll and ask questions at the meeting. On the reverse side of your green admission card the, is your voting paper and instructions. Only those shareholders with a green card have received a voting paper. This can be marked at the time we consider each resolution or at any other stage during the meeting. After the meeting, you can place your completed voting cards in one of the ballot boxes that will be located at the rear at the exit. 
The results of the poll will be released to the ASX later in the day. Holders of pink cards are non-voting shareholders, such as a joint shareholder when the other joint shareholder holds the green voting card. These card holders do not, do not vote by the poll, but they are entitled to ask questions at the meeting. All visitors have been issued with a white card and are not entitled to, uh, to vote or to ask questions, but you are very welcome at the meeting. The minutes of last year's annual general meeting were confirmed as a correct record at the subsequent meeting of directors. The notice of meeting for this year's AGM was circulated to shareholders and I propose to take it as read. We now move to the first item of business. And that concerns consideration of the annual financial statements and reports. The audit and financial statements of the company and the reports of directors and the auditor for the year end of 30 June 2024 have been published and made available to shareholders. In the course of receiving and considering the financial reports, I will now make some general comments about the year under review. This will be followed by an address by our Managing Director, Jason Beddo. So during the period uh, of last financial year, we had continued high inflation and ongoing geopolitical tensions. Argo nevertheless reported a solid profit and maintained its record high annual fully frank dividends to our shareholders. Argo also delivered a full year profit of $253 million for the 2024 financial year, which was down 6.9%. Profit fell overall due to lower dividend income from companies in the investment portfolio, including some of our largest holdings. Most notably, dividends from BHP, Rio Tinto and Woodside Energy were significantly lower, reflecting lower commodity prices. Income generated from option writing and trading activities also declined whilst income from special dividends increased. In August, the board was pleased to declare a final dividend of 18 cents per share, together with the interim dividend of 16.5 cents per share. This brought annual fully frank dividends for the financial year to 34.5 cents per share, matching last year's record high. This underscores an important advantage of the listed investment company or for short LIC structure, which allows us to draw on reserves of retained earnings and franking credits to effectively smooth our dividends over time. In contrast, the cash dividend paid by the constituent companies of the S&P ASX 200 accumulation index fluctuates over time. This volatility was particularly pronounced in the years since the start of the COVID crisis, with the index's cash dividends falling by as much as 45% compared to pre-pandemic levels. Furthermore, since 2019, the index's level of franking has oscillated between 68% and 85%. Throughout the same period, Argo's dividend has remained relatively steady. Importantly, our dividend has been fully franked continuously since 1994. This is particularly valued by those investors seeking a stable and consistent after-tax return. The final dividend also included a, an LIC capital gain component of three cents per share. This is due to the capital gains being crystallised in our portfolio, including due to takeovers. When Argo makes a discounted capital gain, the tax benefit this generates can be passed on to shareholders. In addition to the benefit of franking credits, eligible shareholders can claim a tax deduction in relation to this capital gain. 
we are one of only a handful of Australian companies able to provide our shareholders with this benefit, which is due to our unique status as a long-term investor, not a trader. Argo's ability to pass on this benefit to shareholders distinguishes us from many other managed funds and LICs. You can find more details on your dividend statement or refer to the dividend section of the Shareholder Centre on our website. Over the 12 months to 30 September 2024, Argo's investment performance as measured by the Net Tangible Asset or NTA return, after covering all costs and adjusted for company tax we paid, was an increase of 18.9%. This compares to the S&P ASX 200 accumulation index, which gained 21.8% over the same period. I'd point out that the index return does not take into account any costs. And furthermore, as I've mentioned, the index's constituent companies do, do not pay a consistent or fully frank dividend. As many of you will be aware, Argo's share price has been trading at a discount relative to its NTA for several months. In our view, this is a cyclical trend as reflected in the data over many decades. We believe a key factor driving the current discount is the increased relative appeal of cash investments due to higher interest rates. As Australia's official cash rate rises, Stocks providing stable, consistent dividends become relatively less attractive. Conversely, as interest rates fall, investors who are seeking a consistent income favour so-called yield stocks. This dynamic was especially pronounced during the global COVID pandemic, when the RBA slashed interest rates, reaching a low of just 0.1 of a percent uh, in October 2020. In that ultra-low interest rate environment, the returns on cash investments, such as term deposits, were negligible. This drove, investments to, this drove investors to investments offering stable income and reliable income, such as Argo. During this time, our shareholder numbers surged and our share price traded at a consistent premium to NTA. The month-end share price premium reached a high of 10.9% in January 2022. As we all know, from May 2022, the R began raising the cash rate aggressively to stave off inflation. With official interest rates now at 4.35%, Returns on cash investments are more competitive compared to Argo's fully frank dividend yield. We believe this has put pressure on our share price, particularly as investors reallocate some of their investments to cash. When Australia's rate cutting cycle begins, resulting in lower returns from cash, Argo's ability to maintain and grow its fully frank dividend will become increasingly attractive to investors. We believe this is likely to support Argo's share price relative to its NTA. History shows us that over the long term, our share price will on average trade close to its NTA. In fact, over the past 30 years, Argo's share price has traded at an average of just 0.3 of 1% below its NTA. Earlier this year, we announced that our long-serving Chief Financial Officer, Andrew Hill, would be retiring. At the end of August, we farewelled Andrew after more than 30 years at Argo. This is a remarkable accomplishment. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank him for his dedicated service to the company and as well as his diligence and expertise, which greatly benefited Argo and its shareholders through various market cycles, various events and mergers and acquisitions. On behalf of Argo, I wish Andrew all the very best in his retirement. Stephen Mortimer, Steve, you might just stand up and introduce yourself. 
Stephen Mortimer was sub subsequently appointed CFO for the company, having been promoted from the position of finance officer. Stephen joined the company in 2012 and worked closely with the chief financial officer in Adelaide office throughout the period. He's a certified practicing accountant and a graduate of the Institute of Company Directors. And I'm pleased to formally introduce Stephen to you today. Let me now turn to the outlook. Australia's economy continues to be shaped largely by macroeconomic influences and including persistent inflation. As I referenced earlier, the RBA has attempted to bring down inflation and back within its target range of 2 to 3% through rapid rises in interest rates. The RBA is now navigating a narrow path between keeping rates higher to tame inflation and being too aggressive and sending the Australian economy into recession. Most developed economies are treading a similar path and many other central banks have started to lower interest rates already, including in the United States. However, inflation seems to be a little stubborn in Australia and the RBA is indicating that it's not likely to lower rates until 2025. In the face of all this, the Australian economy remains resilient with low unemployment, continued public and private investment and exports supporting our national income. Although there are a number of risks to the outlook and I'd like to just step through those now. Geopolitical tensions and conflicts represent a higher risk to the world economy at this time than at this time last year. No matter who wins the United States federal election next month, I personally am concerned that the US will become more economically nationalistic, detracting from the benefits of globalisation for the world economy. China, Australia's largest trading partner, and I note largest trading part to something like 120 countries in the world, China uh, has a very sluggish economy, despite some recent stimulus by Chinese authorities. And at home, many Australian consumers are under financial pressure from higher interest rates and a growing cost of living for everyday expenses. And as a result, consumer confidence in particular and spending remains subdued. Against today's dynamic financial, geopolitical and economic backdrop, I'd like to remind our shareholders that since 1946, Argo has navigated through various market cycles, wars and global events, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, the oil price shocks of the 1970s, the 1987 market crash, the dot-com bust, boom and bust, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the ensuing global financial crisis and the more recent coronavirus pandemic. Over nearly eight decades since Argo was founded, the company's overriding objective has been to deliver long-term shareholder returns by providing a reliable, fully frank dividend income and capital growth. This remains our focus by continuing to apply a conservative long-term investment approach within a low-cross business model. I would like to conclude by thanking our Managing Director, Jason Beto, and the Argo team, many of whom are here today, uh, for their hard work and continued dedication to the company and their absolute pursuit for the benefit of shareholders. I'd also like to thank my fellow board members for their ongoing and valuable contributions. I've greatly appreciated it. And importantly, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you, our loyal shareholders, and to any new shareholders of Argo who are here, welcome to Argo. I'd now like to call upon Jason Beto to give his managing director's address. Thank you. Morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I guess from a market perspective, you know, for most of this year, investment markets you know, in Australia and globally have been fixated on when the US Federal Reserve would begin cutting interest rates. 
um, been talked about for some time. And after much anticipation, you know, the central bank started its easing cycle last month. Um, probably kicked it off with a larger than expected cut of 50 basis points than what I guess you know, consensus economists were looking for. Um, in doing so, it alleviated concerns, at least for the moment, of a hard landing for the world's largest economy. Um, also, I guess, announcing the decision, you know, the US Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, he was upbeat in his outlook commentary um, in his assessment of the US labour market. And in response, global markets have become even more positive. So US markets hit a record high last week for the 47th time on Friday night. I think when I started writing this speech, I had 43 uh, record highs. Uh, so literally every third day, the US markets, you know, are hitting, hitting a new high. And I was just sort of looking at this slide this morning, thinking that, you know, it's been an interesting slide, I guess, you know, just to remind myself and others, you know, about COVID. But if we, uh, we run that slide next year, it's not going to look anywhere near as exciting because COVID will be a distant memory more than five years uh, away. So we'll have to think of something else, I think. But clearly, you know, markets have, have well and truly moved on. Um, now, I guess following that lead from the US, you now Australian equities have also advanced. You know, they're currently trading around all-time highs. And in fact, our market hit an all-time high of 8,384 points uh, just last week on October 17. I mean, in between, I guess, the rallies, there have been you know, some volatile market moves. Um, for instance, in the first week of August, the S&P ASX 200 index fell more than 5% as US recession fears rose and the Japanese yen carry trade unwound on the back of Japan putting up interest rates for the first time in a long time. And that sparked a global market sell-off. And actually on August the 5th, uh, the Australian market fell 3.7%. Now that's the largest single day fall really since you know, May 2020 in the heights of COVID. However, it didn't last long. Our positive sentiment returned and Australian shares actually finished the month up and have clearly gone on with it over the preceding sort of six weeks. Domestically, you know, we think rate cuts, you know, they do seem some way off. Uh, inflation remains elevated and the jobs market, you know, continues to be very strong. Um, inflation is showing some signs of easing and discussion of further rate hikes, at least, was notably absent from the latest Reserve Bank of Australia meeting. Now, and this is a marked change from the central bank's prior commentary when, you know, I guess a rate hike was at least you know, considered in the conversation. Commodity prices, which are you know, quite key to about 25% of the Aussie market, but definitely the Australian economy, except gold and a couple of small commodities you know, have been very weak. Uh, amid ongoing concerns about China's economy. However, in the last week of September, Chinese financial regulators announced a series of stimulatory monetary policy initiatives, and they included interest rate cuts, um, housing finance initiatives, and also support for the stock market you know, to directly buy stocks. Optimism that these measures will boost the flailing Chinese economy did trigger a rotation into resource stocks, at least temporarily. Uh, however, the scale and effect of this stimulus remains unclear as China's economy continues to face many structural issues. So 2024, or financial year 2024, you know, was a strong year for the Australian market. Um, the share market performed strongly and despite, I guess, a, a mixed global economic outlook, um, it delivered an above average return of 12.1%. Uh, technology stocks, again, you know, were the stellar outperformers, even though it's only a small part of our market. Uh, they were up 26%, you know, after gaining 30% the prior year in FY23. Uh, only financials led by the banks performed stronger, gaining 29%. And in contrast, you know, telecommunications and utilities were both down. This financial year to date uh, is, is fairly similar. Technology continues to rally. You know, it's up over 15%. Following the US red, uh, sorry, the US Fed rate cut, property stocks have also rallied. They've gained almost 15%. And despite escalating events in the Middle East, all prices remain under pressure and energy is the worst performing sector, down 6%. Utilities and healthcare, they also continue to struggle. And in this environment, um, 
I guess we continue to do you know, what we try and do always is diversify the portfolio to maintain a balanced performance over longer time periods and to deliver shareholders a relatively smooth dividend profile through these market cycles. With this in mind, our recent acquisitions have focused on companies with strong and growing cash flows that are predominantly paying fully frank dividends. Now, these have mainly been among existing holdings. However, we did recently add two new stocks to the portfolio. So professional services consultancy, Wally, and a small initial stake in Imricor Medical Systems. We exited two takeover targets, Quantum Intellectual Property for cash and Illumina after its takeover bid by Alcoa. We also sold down a small parcel of Commonwealth Bank shares after its share price reached a record high. And we used the proceeds to buy some National Australia Bank and Westpac Banking Group shares, which will soon report their results. I thought reporting season, which we kind of use internally, it's almost like exam time. You know, we get to see all the company's results, we get to assess them versus our expectations, but these companies are also assessed against the market, other investors, you know, the press. Um, and you know, it's, so it's a very busy time for those companies that are at June or December year end. Um, and the recent reporting season, which ran through August, uh, was you know, relatively positive for Argo, particularly from a dividend perspective. However, brokers, you know, the sell side brokers, um, had a more, I guess, varied interpretation of company results. So in aggregate, 38% of companies failed to, to meet consensus expectations. And I guess they're referred to as misses, as they've missed what at least the sell side brokers were expecting. 32% um, of companies exceeded or beat expectations. Um, and then the ratio of beats to misses ended up at 0 0.8. Now this is well below the long-term average of 1.4, implying that historically more companies are beating expectations. Um, earnings misses were more common across healthcare, energy and resource firms, where high costs continue to impact earnings. Much like the more recent reporting seasons, companies experienced considerable share price volatility on the day of their result. So approximately a third of stocks moved up and down by more than 5% on the day they reported. Uh, it seems there's very little interest in turnaround stories and there's limited investor patience for underperforming companies. Um, earnings and share price momentum still appear to be the strongest indicators of future performance. Dividends, which were you know, relatively good, um, paid by a number of companies in our portfolio, you know, were above our forecasts, notably QBE Insurance, Lendlease, EVT, IGO, Santos, and Woodside Energy, all declared better than expected dividends, at least by our forecasts. Uh, Woolworths and AUI also declared special dividends. Company accounts showed balance sheets are very strong, um, some of this is due to lower than expected capital expenses, which, you know, there may be some catch up. But this allowed 10 companies to announce new or further buybacks, um, totaling $2.8 billion. In our portfolio, that included Horizon Holdings and Brambles. Um, total ongoing buybacks, including, you know, the large buybacks by the banks, outstanding still to be bought, still exceeds $10 billion in the market. I guess turning just to a few other themes we sort of picked up from reporting season, um, costs remain sticky, particularly wages. So while there's been some, uh, you know, some relief from higher inflation, you know, there is still wage pressure throughout the economy. Um, that's resulted in some margin declines. Interest charges and depreciation charges for some companies were also revised higher, with the largest increases amongst the REITs and industrial sectors. Despite the higher interest rates and cost of living pressures, consumers have been largely resilient. Um, retail spending continues to hold up, and in several instances, you know, companies are expecting them to improve, although this trend does vary across different age cohorts. Um, demand for hospital services remains soft, and some supermarket spending is being impacted with evidence of uh, consumers trading down uh, and looking for products representing better value. So, you know, shopping at Aldi and different, different things. Um, numerous company executives raised concerns about the prevailing regulatory and political environment um, with government intervention in various sectors, such as supermarkets and energy markets, 
Um, project approvals continue to be delayed by increased bureaucratic red tape, and there's more onerous environmental requirements. So I guess amid all the hype around AI, a number of companies gave what I would call less exciting, but more practical examples of how they will use this technology, at least initially. So like for instance, to reduce inefficient manual processes, optimise logistics networks and improve their understanding of consumer behaviour. Uh, we, do, we do believe that AI will create opportunities to reduce costs over time. Um, but yeah, that's probably a, a drawn out process that will take you know, many years, but should be a tailwind. Generally, you know, the outlook commentary remained cautious overall from a lot of management teams, and there was little forward guidance provided for the coming year. As the chairman mentioned about dividends and yields, excluding the post-COVID dip, the Australian share market's dividend yield is now at a low not seen for a considerable time. So the forecast cash yield for the S&P ASX 200 index for financial year 2025 is just 3.5%. And the level of franking is expected to fall to just above 70%. Now, a company's dividend yield is a function of its dividend and share price. And you know, most companies really are expected to maintain or even slightly increase their cash dividend. However, their share prices continue to climb and in some cases aggressively climb, which leads to shrinking yields. So on a sector basis, with the exception of utilities and energy, most sectors are forecast to provide dividend yields below their historic averages. And following up on the Chairman's outlook, uh, we believe you know, the key area of focus for investors remains interest rate movements, both overseas and here domestically. With the commencement of rate cuts in the US, current expectations are for an extended interest rate easing cycle, which is generally a tailwind for the economy and tailwind for equities. Now, assuming the US economy has a soft landing, markets are reacting positively and equities continue to reach record highs. There is increasing focus on the upcoming US presidential election, with two weeks until election day. And I guess it's a little bit exciting for us because they count overnight and so our market's alive. We're the first trading market um, that is seeing the results come in. Um, the outcome is too difficult to predict and the polling remains extremely close. Now, depending on which candidate wins and the composition of the Congress, there are potentially significant geopolitical and economic implications. I mean, chief among those for Australia are trade impacts of Trump's proposed punitive tariffs on China, which are touted to be as high as 60% on some products. We think regardless of which candidate wins though, the market will welcome some stability following a highly disruptive election process. And you know, the polls have really been you know, neck and neck since Kamala Harris was, was nominated. The bookies, though, have really been moving and they've been a pretty good indicator for really the last 10 years. And if I look at live odds, so Donald Trump's now $1.57 and Kamala Harris is two forty. So these guys have been pretty good at picking Trump in 16, Brexit, when all the polls have been wrong. So keep an eye on the bookies. Now... In addition to focusing on dividends, you know, we, we are searching for relative value in the market. And when I say that, when the market's very expensive, you know, things that, that it's a relative game in some ways. And this is a challenge as most of the upward movement in the market is not supported by material earnings growth. Now, this is further exacerbated by the continued de-equitisation of the Australian share market. Now, this dynamic sort of undermines traditional valuation methods with increasing compulsory superannuation inflows, inflating prices in a shrinking share market. And as I mentioned, there's still $10 billion of buybacks being undertaken by Australian companies, and there's far less than that being issued. Another thing that's been a real, I guess, probably surprise even to us, um, is just the extent of the recent bank outperformance. You know, it's been phenomenal, really, um, resulting in record valuations. Now, a number of the banks will start to report next week uh, and we think their results actually will be strong. They'll deliver strong earnings growth and there's potential for further capital management. 
One factor driving the bank's outperformance has also been the lack of investor interest in resource stocks due to a weak and uncertain China. However, the recent stimulus announcements in China may see some shift in the resources, which would likely be funded from the banks. So we're just keeping an eye on that. Um, we have no debt, we have cash available and a diversified portfolio, and we believe we're well positioned to navigate this, I guess, the evolution of this next economic cycle we're entering, applying our conservative long-term investment approach. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank all the Argo staff. It's, it's a very small team. There's more than half of them in the room today. You've probably met some coming in and you certainly speak to them later. Uh, and you know, everyone remains fully committed to the company's success across both our Sydney and Adelaide offices. I'd also like to thank Andrew Hill for his contribution to Argo for more than three decades. And you know, I've clearly worked very closely with him for the last 15 years. I wish him well and his wife in retirement. I'd also like to congratulate Stephen on his appointment as CFO, and I'm really looking forward to working with him you know, over the coming years as well. So, the you know, company's in good hands. Also, I'd like to uh, thank the contribution from the board, uh, chairman, non executive directors, and I look forward to working with them as we best navigate this next period for you. And you know, finally, uh, I wish all you, all you well for the remainder of 2025, sorry, 2024, I'm already ahead of myself. Um, but look, we do thank you for your continued support, you know, for turning up at AGMs and roadshows, for asking questions, and I look forward to seeing you um, for our roadshows back in 2025, so thank you. Well, thank, thanks very much, uh, Jason. And let me just reinforce uh, the roadshows that we've started, uh, just run them for two years now in May each year. It's a more informal meeting. We try to give you a bit more information about the company and its investments. Uh, there's no uh, formalities to the meetings and I think it's a good way for shareholders to gather more information about the company, its portfolio. So I'd encourage you to attend if you're able to do so. Uh, Julian McCarthy, who's the signing audit partner from the company's external auditor, Price Waterhouse Coopers, is present here today, Julian, and he's able to answer any questions relevant to the conduct of the audit, uh, the preparation and content of the auditor's report for the 30 June, year end of 30 June 2024. Shortly, I will address any shareholder questions on the financial reports and on general matters, bearing in mind that we'll separately consider the remuneration report and other items of AGM business later in the meeting, at which time there will be ample opportunity to ask questions relating to those items. In addition, we have received some questions in advance of the meeting and I'll also answer all of those. To ask a question, please have your green or pink card ready and make your way to the microphone. There's one there, uh, is that the only one? Oh no, there's one in the middle aisle as well. Make your way to the microphone so that other shareholders can hear you. Please state your name and any affiliation when you're invited to speak uh, and limit yourself to one question at a time in consideration of other shareholders. So, I've opened the floor. Are there any general questions or comments about the company and its financial reports at this time? Uh, yes, in the middle. Hi, <clears throat> Hi my name's Peter Croft. Um, I submitted my questions to you in late December and again a month ago, and they concern the topic of climate change and net zero, and I guess the extreme weather events. I'm asking these questions both as a shareholder and also acknowledging that my mother who passed away recently was a shareholder for a very long time. Um, Argo's in a special position in that it, by virtue of its shareholding in many companies, it can <coughs> quiz those companies. Um, <clears throat> and so my questions are, how has the threat of climate change been incorporated into the conversations that Argo has with the companies in which it invests. I'm thinking, for example, uh, resources, insurance, 
I don't know about you, but my insurance premiums have soared. <clears throat> Second question, do all the companies in which Argo invests have publicly available climate change plans? And finally, what changes does Argo envisage to the areas in which it invests considering the, the question of climate change? For example, more emphasis on investment in green infrastructure. Well, thank, thanks very much, Peter. And as you say, you, you did send those questions in in advance as well. So um, we've received another question from another shareholder uh, along very similar lines uh, from Rick Mason, uh, who says, I'm a long-term investor in Argo and I express my concern about Argo investing in fossil fuel companies, in particular Woodside. I'm going to ask the managing director to uh, address those questions about uh, this issue, I mean, uh, commonly called ESG or um, Environment, uh, Sustainability and, and Governance, uh, a very important issue. Uh, and I'm going to ask Jason to address it, please. Uh, thanks, Peter, for your questions. Yes, we've had, we have yeah, spoken previously. Uh, look, it's, it's certainly an important part of our process. And we, we have a lot of, as you say, we're in a luxurious position to, to speak with a lot of these companies. Um, we're a little pragmatic when I go. We're like if we're at, if you're an energy company or a mining company, um, you know it's going to take some time to improve your whether it be carbon footprint um, and, and what you're trying to do versus I guess a technology industry that you know is apart from maybe using power at a data centre um, is not you know notably or at least be look like it's a polluter. So we, we spend a lot of time with management teams. Um, a lot of companies have got a lot of public documentation. Um, I did have a look for you. So I think 77 of the top 100 have public um, targets and carbon targets. Um, so not, not all. And that's probably about the same for our portfolio. It's about three quarters of our portfolio would have public measures. Recently, though, in the last two weeks, all of the climate reporting has been legislated. So the uh, mandatory climate reporting has been legislated and also the Australian accounting standards as to how that will be reported. So I, I think within a couple of years, most companies, now not everything on the ASX, there is a size tenure, but at least every company that makes the ASX 200 will be climate reporting with targets. Um, so that that answer will become 100% in time um, if that's your investment universe. So look, it's important we score companies on how we rate their performance, um, but we do do it within the context of the industry they work in. Um, Woodside specifically is a, is a classic example. I mean, it's an energy company, um, so by nature it's going to be a polluter, you know, a big polluter. Yeah, Woodside, and I guess if I step back, you know, they are largely an LNG or gas. And we think gas is going to be a very important part of the transition to renewable fuels. I mean, they will get better. Battery technology will get better. But, you know, we're clearly not there yet. Um, so Woodside has a comprehensive sustainability strategy. Um, they have a sustainable development um, report. They have public targets on reducing their scope one and scope two. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, 2030 and 2035 targets. And... You know, and the market's not loving it. I guess this is the, the third part of your question. You know, they are investing in products and services, you know, for the energy transition, moving away from, from their carbon footprint. Um, investing in green infrastructure is a real challenge because a lot of it is uneconomic without the government subsidising these developments. Um, one of our, was a bigger investment, it's fallen, is APA. Um, now, APA has gone and bought a renewable energy portfolio in Northwestern Australia to service the mining industry as they uh, you know, also transition to a lower footprint. And you know, there's a lot of capex involved. You know, the share price has really suffered, um, which you know, flows through our returns as well. Um, so direct investing is, is, is tricky. You know, I guess when we sit back and think about it, you know, we want companies that will have a long-term sustainable future. So we look at what we think the earnings impact may be, you know, what a $30, $50 carbon price will do to certain industries and try and look at it, I guess, at this stage, you know, on a relatively short-term view, you know, say, let's say three years, um, the economic impacts on dividends and share prices. But look, it's, a, it's an ongoing, I guess, project. It's an ongoing 
you know, it's never going to change. I think, you know, AI, data and environmental concerns are going to continue to be there and so they're certainly discussed. Thanks, Jason. Any other questions or comments? Yes, in the in the middle, and I'll come to the on the, uh, on the other side next. Oh. In the middle. Good morning. My name's Tony Greco. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed with Argo's performance, especially over the past few years, but I've just got a, a few details here if I can go through them. Oh. I mean, I first bought Argo shares in 1984, which is 40 year anniversary this year, so thank you very much for your congratulations. They were the good old days. Uh, we regularly received bonus issues and discounted rights issues. Um, and the dividends were maintained on that, those extra shares, the, the new shares. I look back at my records and my average cost of Argo shares from 1984 up to 1996 was $1.02. So at the current price of nearly $9, it's been a very good investment. And of late, I still thought Argo still performing well. And it seemed not long ago we had a rights issue at $4.40. So the investments doubled in value. Um, but recently I looked at it and went, hold on, that was 2004, 20 years ago. And I would have thought a good investment should double maybe every 10 years, not 20 years. And I probably should have been keeping a closer eye on my investments. Now, if I'd really been more observant in your annual report, uh, and you've had the slide up as well, it shows that in the past 20 years, a $10,000 portfolio holding has grown to 18,282, which is not actually double, but you know, we got close there. You know, the chart does show a higher value if you include dividends and a really high value if you include the franking credits, but that is somewhat misleading as payment of frank dividends. And I know you touched on it today that not all, you know, 70% of the companies pay frank dividends or, or, you know, but the thing is, you know, many, uh, ASX listed companies for a frank dividends and the franking credits are not uh, sorry are not of uh, you know benefit to everybody like for, for myself personally it's it's of minimal use I only get a small amount of them back uh, Australian Foundation investment in their annual review report a similar number I guess that's an LIC thing but at least they sort of note it assumes the shareholder can take full advantage of franking credits so just the suggestion that you might want to include that disclaimer. So, as I said, I've sort of become disappointed of the, the performance recently, um, especially with respect to the share price, which you know, I suppose you're going to say, well, you can't control. But just you know, last night, charted on asx.com.au, the past 10-year growth of the All Lords, which hasn't, you know, um, performed anywhere near as, as well as the... Um, S&P index, but it's up 55%. Australian Foundation Investment up 25%. Argo up 13%. And it's supported by the shareholder update, and you had the slide up there as well, which shows the differential between the Argo total shareholder return and the ASX 200 accumulation index. Um, and there's a 3% differential each year. One's 5 point something, the other one's 8 point something. And actually looking at the 20 year graph, you can see it's actually flat line between about 2006, 2007, 2008. So um, just wondering what's changed since then? Is it not being able to recover from the GFC or have we changed the way we've invested? So I understand why you can't control the share price, but my question is, do you review your performance? Do you try to understand why you've underperformed the index over these past years? And by that, I mean having a deeper dive rather than just giving anecdotal evidence saying, well, we've got expenses, we pay capital gains tax, and sometimes we trade at a discount. Um, so I guess that's the question. Do you deeper dive and look at your holdings, each company, and say, well, should we keep holding this or shouldn't we? Thank, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I'm going to make some introductory comments and then ask Jason to uh, address some of the more detailed issues about the portfolio, but um, yes, absolutely. We do very much look at our performance uh, relative to the index, relative to the peers. But let me remind you, the company has two objectives. One is to produce a reliable, fully frank dividend, and the other is capital growth. And the combination of those two, we think, provides a very good 
investment for a certain class of investors. Um, you've mentioned and we've put the chart up about the uh, discount between the share price or premium, discount or premium, between the share price and our net tangible asset banking. And that certainly has an influence on any of the comparisons you want to make by picking a particular starting point or, or uh, whatever in that comparison. And uh, as we've shown over 30 years, that's gone up to premiums as high as uh, nearly 11% uh, and currently uh, trading at quite a, di a deep discount of near 10%. But over the 30 year period, our share price has traded very close to NTA on average. So you will get these fluctuations depending on what's el what else is happening in financial markets. Uh, I'll reference the uh, changes in interest rates and they've been quite important in their influence. But also uh, there's a little bit about uh, the overall flavour of the share market. You talked about coming out of uh, the GFC and so forth. At that time, uh, some of Australia's big companies, particularly the banks, were doing extremely well in the capital sense, but also playing, paying big dividends. And so for an investor like Argo that's trying to produce post both dividend income and capital gains, that, that was a very good period. Right now, uh, there's a lot of growth or tech stocks that um, uh, are being favoured by some investors. They tend not to pay dividends or pay very low dividends. Uh, they make it quite hard to put large numbers of those into our portfolio. Uh, and so we're going to go through periods. But I think if you stand back, as you said, you've been a shareholder for 40 years, through 40 years, through different cycles, uh, Argo's approach of a conservative approach of producing both a reliable, fully frank dividend and capital growth has shown its worth through many different changes in the market and the world economy. Um, so uh, yes, I think you can pick any particular period and make issues about it. The reality is every meeting we are looking at the performance of the company and talking about the issues that impact and so forth with a view to producing that long-term value for shareholders. Jason, something you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, sure. A couple of comments, I guess. Um, and, and I do tell you, on the disclaimer on the franking credits, like we do quite a lot, the worm. You do have to consider dividends, and I put it in the context of Warren Buffett hates dividends, so he doesn't pay dividends to shareholders. So when you sign up for Warren, you're in for the capital ride. So if Argo was to do that, which is... We pay out 100%, of, you know, give or take, of our profits every year from income, and we pay that out as fully frank dividends. If we didn't pay a dividend, the capital that we're keeping, we'd be reinvesting, um, at, you know, circa 7 to 10%, and I think you'd find the capital value would be significantly higher um, than just going to, I think you said, $18,000. So you do have to consider them together because they're returns that shareholders are getting. And the one, one way to look at it in a simple way is, is looking at something like Berkshire where they say, we don't want to pay dividends. We will just reinvest the capital for you and you get a compounding on that. The other thing about the total shareholder return, and look, we don't, look, we don't like trading at a 10% premium, to be honest, either, because we think that you know, shareholders may have a disappointing period because the average is closer to NTA. Right as we speak at the moment, though, 10 years ago, Argo was trading at a very big premium. So we're now at a big discount. So you've almost got a 20% share price differential from top to bottom. Now, I think what's sort of lost a little bit is that um, when Argo was trading at 10, I think we got to 10.20, 10.06, the NTA was about $9. Now the share price is around $9. The NTA is actually a record high. It's about 10.06 or 10.05. So I think the share price movement, you know, in some ways does distort a little bit, you know, that Argo has probably, you know, largely kept up with the market. Um, look, we always want to do better. And look, yeah, we've probably been at times a bit conservative. I mean, interest rates really were cut aggressively out of the GFC and have stayed pretty low and there's been a really big tailwind for growth stocks, for technology stocks. Um, and, you know, we probably are a bit underrepresented. Um, they don't pay as big a dividends. Um, some of them pay no dividends. Then we like to have some. Um, my analysts would like to have lots. Um, so we're always balancing, you know, who's paying dividends, who's paying fully frank dividends um, versus, versus the capital growth. Um, you know, we review it, 
daily. I mean, the team want to beat the market. I want to beat the market. The board holds us to account constantly. Um, you know, some things that we didn't own Fortescue. You know, we should have probably owned Fortescue. I mean, it was a minnow to, to run up to $25. I mean, that as a performance versus the index, that was certainly, you know, a lag on our performance. You know, went to a top 20 company. Um, you know, we decided not to own Fortescue and we'd own Iron Ore through Rio and BHP and they didn't perform the same. So, look, it's constantly addressed. I mean, that, that's what we do. That's what the team are paid for um, to get the best outcomes at the portfolio level for shareholders. Thanks. Um, they had a question out on the other side there. Yeah, I'll, I'll have another question later if I can. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, over here. My name is Colin Pilcher. I'm a shareholder, long term. Um, I really want to make a comment that uh, one of the strengths of Argo is the longevity of their board. People don't flip in and flip out. So the ideas you have are basically long term and not just short term um, implications. Um, the the, because of the long-term um, focus in the company, you're going to have blips up and down and like most of the LICs at the moment, you're trading below your asset backing. But uh, I'd just like to tell you, well, say that I, I would like you to stick to your knitting and, and, and do what you are but look for opportunities and I'd like to see a little bit more uh, looking at, at technology shares. Uh, and if you can go back in time, look for ProMedicus. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Colin. I'll take that one as a comment. Yes, uh, the lady in the middle. Bronwyn Newitt, I would like to follow on from what our uh, first person who, uh, who asked a question was saying. I am very concerned about Argo's shares in Woodside, particularly the Scarborough Gas Project. Um, this area is the Ningaloo Marine Park, including the Ningaloo Reef. It oh. contains thousands of creatures, a number of which are endangered. The gas project is going to be dumping millions of tonnes of waste through drilling in the area. I did hear what you say, said, Jason, in the fact of environmental protections. However, what I have found in the past is that governments from either political party, and I am talking about state and federal, when it comes to these big companies, even though there are environmental protections, uh, they seem to be not ignored, but the actual company's representatives, their staff, are the people who are supposed to check on these environmental protections. And these people, could lose their jobs if they don't um, basically adhere to what the company wants. So I would really like to see Argo divest all of the Woodside shares. Furthermore, I put it to you that gas is not going to be an energy that is going to last long term. Countries, even Australia, are going to renewables. Therefore, for the sake of the actual area, the marine part, the reef, and also the sake of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I would like Argo to divest these shares. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for that comment. I, I would... I understand your passion and, and interest and in a vital issue. I, I would just venture that the position you've put would not be regarded as accurate by the company. 
And certainly, I mean, I used to work in the federal government. The position you've put about the way environmental law is administered and that is not accurate. So I understand your passion. Uh, I think from Argo's point of view, we do engage with the company. We, we follow what their practices are. Um, we make it clear what we invest in. Uh, we take ESG very seriously. Uh, you can read about it on our website, how it's woven into our investment process, and it is real. And the last comment I'd make to you, our, our view, and uh, my personal view, I mean, I uh, spent a career working in, uh, in uh, many of these areas, that our transition to zero emissions energy, which will involve a lot of renewables, but renewables not the quality we're seeking, it's actually zero emissions or low emissions we're seeking. Uh, the forms of energy that we have for that today, uh, typically people think of wind and solar, are very intermittent. And on average for the year, solar produces power for less than 20% of the year wind for less than 30% of the year. You can look these numbers up on the AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operators website. Um, so they've got to be backed up by something. Now everybody talks about batteries, but the physics of batteries are that they can store limits amounts of energy. And so we're going to need something that will back up these renewable sources, intermittent sources, weather dependent sources, we're going to need something that's reliable to back them up to produce electricity 24-7. And yes, batteries will be part of that. But uh, my view and the view of the company is that, and the view of the federal government is that gas is going to play, play a vital role in backing up our transition to those low emissions energy sources. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Timothy Redman. I'm just looking at that slide you've got up there, which is showing pollution at the moment. And I just wondered if you have checked some of these companies that they are not polluting our seas. Uh, I'm not sure what that, that um, photo is, but uh, yes, the red uh, in the water is a big question mark. I'm not sure, can anybody tell me what that photo is? No. I'd say, look, I'd say it's more of a sandstorm, Russell, red blowing sand. the red sand into the water. <laughs> Could well be. Western Australia. It is. Uh, Meredith, perhaps you might be able to tell us later on what that photo is and I can tell people later in the meeting. Yes, in the middle, please. Good morning. My name is Greg O'Connell and I represent three and a half million proxy shares and around 230 shareholders on behalf of the Australian Shareholders Association. By my quick uh, head count, that, uh, that number exceeds the number of attendees in this room. Um, as background, I'd mention Argo's changes to the long-term incentive arrangements for executive remuneration four years ago in 2020. ASA did not support those changes and voted against the Argo REM report on that occasion and for the following three years. Mr Chairman, I would like to acknowledge the time spent, particularly in the last 12 months by yourself, several of your executives and your new chair of remuneration in meeting with the ASA to discuss those 2020 long-term incentive changes and assist ASA with our analysis of these incentives, of the reward of thresholds and the resultant remuneration. ASA now has a much better understanding of how the LTI framework has operated to date how the remuneration results compare with peer companies and how these incentives are likely to incentivise investment performance into the future. We retain a strong ongoing interest in Argo's investment performance and how the remuneration plan incentivises performance. We also recognise the challenges for large and broad-based active fund managers such as Argo to outperform their benchmark, the S&P ASX 200 Accumulation Index. With our current understanding of Argo's long-term incentive arrangements, I wanted to highlight that we will be voting for the REM report when that uh, item comes up uh, on the agenda. Um, and I did have a question. I, uh, I had a question which I, I'm 
I confess I'm really happy has been uh, uh, answered to a significant degree. I was, but I still have a little bit of it left. I was going to ask the question as to, as to whether you could elaborate on how you ensured Argo's performance remained competitive and value-adding for your shareholders by comparison with PLX and index tracking ETFs. I really do appreciate the, the long-term perspective that both the chairman and the MD have given us on dividends, sources of dividends, franking levels and franking smoothing. Um, but if I can focus particularly on the, the, uh, the, the, the marketplace and the competition offered by ETFs as to whether you have any particular elaboration you can make as to how Argo will remain uh, um, uh, competitive and, and differentiated against that, that threat, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Well, uh, let me first acknowledge the, the effort that the Australian Shareholders Association has put in this year in uh, engaging with Argo to understand uh, the change that we made to remuneration back in 2019. Uh, as many shareholders will know, it's been a point of difference between us for a period. And I'm pleased to... Uh, say that during the course of the last 12 months, the Shareholders Association has put in a, a huge effort in uh, engaging with the company and understanding those that change, it's a single change, uh, from 2019. And I'm pleased that uh, you're now at the point where you understand it to the point that you're going to vote in favour of it. So thank you very much for, for that effort. If I just come on to the question you've asked about ETFs, um, yeah, ETFs uh, will provide you with a particular style of investment and for some people, they're good. They track an index. As we've talked about, um, the ASX 200 index, the, the level of dividends on those uh, have over time generally been below. There was one year where they were above, but generally been below that, uh, that Argo Investments produces and the level of franking credits uh, certainly less. I think Jason gave the number that it uh, expected to be about 70% uh, in this coming year. So the, the great point of differential for uh, Argo Investments in the listed investment company structure is, well, A, that we structured the portfolio in a way as we produce the fully frank dividend. So that's one of the uh, things that we're looking at in terms of constructing a portfolio and, and making decisions. But secondly, we have the ability to smooth over time our dividend uh, and have enough franking credits to be fully franking that even if the level of credits uh, um, received in any single year might be a little bit less. The third thing I would say is the very low cost structure that... Uh, Argo investments have. At the current time, our management expense ratio, as we call it, is just 0.15% of the portfolio. Uh, many ETFs will charge you a fee of about 0.4%, some even a bit higher than that. Um, yeah, not a huge difference, but it's just a little bit less that you as an investor are getting uh, in return. So those things that... Uh, we're producing the reliable fully frank dividend as well as the capital growth. We smooth dividends over time. We fully frank them through the whole period. That's uh, our focus. And we're in a low cost structure. So I'd say they're the major points of difference with an ETF. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions on this item? Yes. <clears throat> So just following up from what I was talking about earlier, um, I did sort of go back to about 2011, just looking through the annual reports and just trying to get a feel for, you know, in, anything that's changed that's, that's decreased the performance over the past few years. And there's nothing really that stood out, to be honest. Um, possibly, uh, and you, you put up your slide there showing the resources seem to be undervalued, but there seems to be a higher... Uh, percentage of, of uh, resource stocks being held in the portfolio and they seem to really be very cyclical up and down and don't really have the capital growth. Um, there, there were a few losses in there um, and but nothing you know from say Freedom Foods, AMP and just this last year the star but not such big losses that should have a drastic effect on the portfolio. So just my other question to, to the board and, and maybe to PwC is in 2024 
over 10,000 shares in the star, 10 million shares, sorry, in the star were sold. And just looking through the annual reports and roughly your cost of them, I'd imagine the loss is about 30 million. Um, no mention was made in the annual report regarding the sale or the loss. And okay, if I've got the accounting right, gains and losses are nested off uh, and transferred from the investment revaluation re reserve to the capital profits reserve. So the question, do you or PwC think that with the value at around about 10% or more of annual profit, that loss maybe should have been separately disclosed? And just even following on from the accounting treatment, you know, do you think that shareholders would actually appreciate honesty and sort of putting your hand up and saying, hey, listen, we stuffed up on this. You know, we all make mistakes. And, you know, then did you review from that loss and say, well, this is where we got it wrong. You know, we thought they had a whole lot of land that was valuable. We didn't realise that the effect of the Crown Casino in Sydney would have you know, a detrimental effect on. We didn't anticipate COVID or the effect that had or we didn't realise there were so many deficiencies with the regulators. So I guess two, two questions there, if I can. One, should it have been disclosed separately? And two, do you think shareholders, or do you think shareholders would appreciate hearing that? And three, what did you learn from that? Jason? Uh, yeah, sure, look. Um, look, Star, we, we, I think we've confessed about Star a few times historically. Um, look, we sold some of our Star at a, at a better price than where it's currently trading. So, and, and the losses, Losses are, are relatively large. We've sold it over three financial years to, to offset some tax that we are paying. Uh, I don't think we're, we're hiding from that, and that's one benefit of Argo. I mean, one of the untangible benefits is we get to sit up here and you get to ask us questions about what we've done well and poorly. Um, and, you know, an ETF, ETF and Star as well. Um, so, and look, we review every decision whether it's good or bad you know if it's a good one how can we replicate it and if it's a bad one what did we miss I mean you know not pointing fingers now but you know we were you know lied to by management and directors at the time we took them at face value and that's you know our our mistake for for believing them I guess we should have been more critical um, and a number of those things that you mentioned you know the crown crown coming to Sydney um, the lack of high rollers behaviour since COVID, the regulation on no cash um, and less cash going through the casinos, um, you know, any, any number of things. So, you know, lesson learned. Uh, but I do, I think, you know, we, if anything, provide more disclosure and, and more openness than most investment products in the country, whether they be managed funds, ETFs or otherwise. So, um, and, I, and I guess to, to your point with the, the relevance, I mean, I think when we're looking at the relevance and clearly the auditors can speak for themselves, but that, that's against the balance sheet of nearly seven and a half billion dollars of assets or the moving comprehensive income, which is, I think it was about seven or eight hundred million dollars. So I think in the context of, of those things, you know, it doesn't sort of, I guess, technically reach materiality thresholds, not saying we shouldn't talk about it, um, versus the, the income, which is a very different number. Um, so look, you know, we try and learn by our mistakes so we don't make them again. Um, I guess one of the challenges about performance is when, when Argo was $1 and $4, you know, we were a billion dollar market cap. So if we wanted to go and put 1% of the portfolio into something, it was $10 million. We could buy it and we could get out. Now we want to put 1% of the portfolio into a stock, it's $80 billion, sorry, $80 million. Mm -hmm. But it takes a while. I mean, the market's not as liquid as you would think. And between passive funds, ETFs, Industry funds that don't trade a lot as well. Yeah, there's not a lot of liquidity once you get outside probably the top 50 stocks. So, um, yeah, just a, another challenge, I guess, as you get bigger. No, thanks, Jason. Yeah, no, it's not easy being an investor, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions on this item? If not, I'll now move to the next item of business. Item number two on the agenda concerns the adoption of the remuneration report. The Corporations Act requires all ASX listed companies to submit a remuneration report to their shareholders for consideration and adoption by way of a non-binding resolution. 
Argo's remuneration report is detailed within the annual report and outlines the company's executive remuneration and its relationship to company performance. The key principles of Argo's remuneration strategy are to align the remuneration structure with shareholders' interests, to link a significant component of remuneration with the creation of a shareholder value through dividend growth and portfolio performance, and to ensure remuneration is competitive and fair and attracts and rewards talent. Assuring that our remuneration structure is linked to value creation for shareholders is achieved by awarding the managing director and specified executives with a combination of fixed remuneration, short-term incentive, which focuses on one year, and long-term incentive opportunities, the latter focusing on four years. Alignment of the long-term interests of shareholders and executives is achieved by a significant component of executive pay being performed based on an at-risk uh, measure and measured over an extended period and also by awarding some executive remuneration in the form of Argo shares rather than cash. All our employees are Argo shareholders. Performance is measured relative to the ASX, sorry, to Argo's listed investment company peer group and to the uh, S&P ASX 200 share market index. The company's remuneration structure is explained in detail in the remuneration report within the annual report. The board considers that it is fair, competitive, aligns with Argo's corporate objectives and the interests of shareholders and genuinely rewards sustained good performance achieved without taking undue risks. I now move that the motion, the motion that the remuneration report for the year ended 30 June 2024 be adopted. Can I ask that any shareholder who wishes to ask a question regarding the remuneration report specifically, please make their way to the microphone now. For your information, whilst uh, people are coming forward, the details of the proxy votes received on this resolution uh, should appear on the screen. Yes, there they are. Please note that this resolution is advisory only and does not bind the directors of the company. However, should 25% or more of shareholders vote against the remuneration report for two years in a row, then shareholders at the second AGM will be asked to vote on whether all directors should stand for re-election. Are there any questions regarding the remuneration report? I do have one that's come in uh, in advance. I might deal with that now. It, it comes from uh, a company uh, shareholder, actually, Ailey Proprietary Limited. And uh, just... Ailey Proprietary Limited uh, asks, please justify the fees paid to directors without reference to peer comparison. Uh, in simple terms, the amount of money for the actual work done. Well, the role of a non-executive director of an ASX listed public company is one that requires a, a great deal of skill and expertise. Uh, as well as carrying a number of weighty legal responsibilities. Argo Investments manages over $7 billion on behalf of more than 90,000 shareholders. As the assessments of independent research houses, rating agencies and proxy advisors will attest, the board needs to be comprised of a diverse group of skilled and experienced people to perform its work and to give confidence to investors. History tells us that individuals also put their name and reputation on the line when they take on the role of a director of a publicly listed company. The workload is not measured simply in terms of the number of meetings, although that might be the only data we do publish, but it's not measured simply in terms of the number of meetings. 
Directors need to undertake preparation and research in advance of and between meetings. And in Argo's case, individual directors communicate with the MD and the investment team as part of the ongoing investment process. Director education and regulatory awareness are also needed to remain current. For example, the Australian Institute of Company Directors requires its members and fellows to undertake significant ongoing professional development to maintain their membership grade. And we've just uh, heard just recently of the work to uh, liaise with shareholders in the case of the Australian Shareholders Association this year. We had uh, many meetings over a number of uh, uh, hours, actually, numbers of hours. Uh, we set directors' fees at a level to attract appropriate people and reward them for the contributions they make collectively and individually to the work of the company. Are there any other questions with regard to the remuneration report? If not, I'll now put the resolution to the meeting. I remind you that we are voting by poll. If applicable, please mark your green voting card for item number two. Thank you, I'll, next, I'll move to the next item of business. The, item three on the agenda concerns the re-election of Liz Lewin or Elizabeth Lewin. Liz retires by rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and being eligible offers herself for re-election today. The details of Liz's qualifications and experience are included in the notice of meeting. The other directors unanimously recommend that shareholders vote in favour of Liz's re-election as they consider that she uh, continues to be well qualified to act as an independent non-executive director of the company. I now invite Liz to address the meeting. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a privilege to be with you here today. Three years ago, I was honoured to be re-elected by shareholders as a non-executive director on the board of Argo. I have dedicated myself to this role and remain deeply committed to representing your interests. Today, I stand for re-election and respectfully seek your support to continue serving on the board for the next three years. With over 30 years of experience, including 17 years in Europe, my career has spanned several key financial sectors, including equity markets, wealth management, investment banking, and superannuation. Leading businesses at UBS Investment Bank in Europe and serving as CEO of UBS Wealth Management in both the UK and Australia, allowed me to gain a broad perspective and develop deep industry expertise overseeing significant investment management operations. In my roles as CEO, I refined skills in governance, risk management, talent development, and teamwork, skills I consider essential to contributing to Argo's continued success. In addition to my executive career, my non-executive roles have encompassed governance responsibilities in superannuation, and I have chaired many investment committees. My directorships extend to other organisations, including the Art Gallery of New South Wales, the Australian Chamber Orchestra, St Vincent's Clinic Research Foundation, and the Australian Olympic Foundation. Along with my passion for Argo's mission, I bring a range of relevant skills and experience, including a deep understanding of investment markets and risk management, an international perspective informed by my experience in both Europe and Australia, comprehensive knowledge of the Australian superannuation and wealth management industries, with a strong focus on what matters most to shareholders, a collaborative leadership style with a commitment to working alongside teams to achieve the best possible outcomes for our shareholders. If re-elected, I look forward to continuing my work with the board and with Argo's leadership to serve you, our shareholders, by delivering on our mission of maximising long-term returns through a balanced approach to capital growth and dividends. It will be an honour to continue to represent you 
and I respectfully ask for your support in my re-election to the Board of Directors today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Liz. I now move the motion that Elizabeth Ann Lewin be re-elected as a director of the company. Can I ask that any shareholders to, wish to ask a question regarding the resolution make their way to the microphone, please? For your information, the details of the proxy votes received on this resolution currently appear on the screen. A simple majority of greater than 50% in favour is required to pass this resolution. If there are no questions, I'll now put this resolution to the meeting. If applicable, please mark your green voting card for item number three. Thank you, I'll now move to the next item on the agenda. Item four of the agenda regards the re-election of Leanne Buck. Leanne retires by re rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and being eligible, offers herself for re-election today. Details of Leanne's qualifications and experience are included in the notice of meeting. Other directors unanimously recommend that shareholders vote in favour of Leanne's re-election and as they consider that she continues to be well qualified to act as an independent non-executive director of the company. I now invite Leanne to briefly address the meeting. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning once again. As Russell mentioned, my name is Leanne Buck. I joined the Board of Argo in 2022, and I am uh, also the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. It is a privilege to, seek to serve as a director of Argo, and I'm honored to be seeking your support for my re-election today. As outlined in the notice of meeting, I am a chartered accountant, and I have 30 years, I've had a 30-year career in global investments and asset management. I've covered a wide variety of areas, including funds management, capital markets, superannuation, long-term investments, and risk management. I've worked in Australia, as well as globally, starting my career in Canada, and I've also worked in the United States. I have a significant non-executive uh, director experience as well, focused on public and private boards, as well as not-for-profit entities. I've served as chair and member of audit and risk and remuneration committees on these boards. My directorships have included entities in a variety of sectors, including utilities, transport, energy transition, real estate, and social and affordable housing. I also currently serve on the boards of Osnet Services and St. George Community Housing. Since joining the board of Argo two years ago, I've been impressed with the caliber of the team and the focus on Argo's strategy of delivering long-term investment performance and consistent and growing dividends through a low cost operating model. I believe that I have the skills to make a valuable contribution to Argo Investments. With your support today, I look forward to drawing on my experience to continue to contribute to Argo, working with the management team and my fellow directors. I look forward to the opportunity to meet with you uh, after the meeting today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leanne. A simple majority of greater than 50% in favour is required to pass this resolution. Are there any questions regarding Leanne's re-election? While you're thinking about that, uh, let me put the resolution to the meeting. Uh, and uh, if applicable, please mark your green voting card for item number four. Can we have the proxy votes that have been received for Leanne, thank you. If there are no questions, I shall move on. That uh, concludes consideration of the formal items of business on the meeting. Um, 
there are a couple of things I want to just uh, inform you about. Firstly, I've been told the photo that was there earlier comes from Broome in uh, northwestern Australia, and uh, I don't know if uh, you've been there, but uh, there's Pindan everywhere, and uh, it gets into everything. So I suspect that was just uh, what the photo was. Um, the second thing concerns uh, a, a very important matter for me personally. Argo Investments has been going through a period of board renewal over the past few years and I've been updating you at each year's AGM on the progress of that renewal. Four of our long-serving directors all joined the board around the same time. And to give some board continuity, we've spread their retirement and replacement over a few years. And so to complete the process of renewal, I will be retiring from the board at the end of 2024. I informed the board of my intention to retire earlier this year. The board has elected Mr. Peter Warne as my replacement as chair. And consequently, Peter Warne will become chairman of Argo Investments Limited from 1 January 2025. I congratulate Peter. A process to choose my replacement on the board of directors has commenced. For my part, it's been an absolute honour to serve on the board of directors of Argo Investments Limited for the past 13 years and the last six years as chairman. Argo Investments is a special company, one that's clear about its goals and the unrelenting pursuit of them for the benefit of shareholders for over three quarters of a century. During my time as a director and as chairman, Argo Investments has consistently produced attractive fully frank dividends and indeed record dividends for the last two years, as well as capital growth for shareholders. The company has also evolved to reflect the contemporary society within which it works, including diversity on the board of directors. My time as chairman has included guiding the company through the COVID pandemic, which posed many challenges, including for me personally in chairing the AGM sitting alone in my house in Canberra. I've overseen a significant process of board renewal, which has set the company up with a skilled, experienced and diverse board, well equipped to face the opportunities and challenges ahead. I know that I'm leaving the company in very good hands and I look forward to being a happy shareholder for many years to come. As I said, Peter Warren is recuperating at home, but as Argo's chairman-elect, he has recorded a short message, which we will now play. Thank you, Russell, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me apologise for not being with you this morning in person. I had some surgery a few weeks ago, which has made it difficult to travel at the moment, and will for another few weeks. I look forward to being with you in person next year at the 2025 Annual General Meeting. Let me say how honoured I am to be elected by the Directors as Chairman of the Argo Investments Board from the 1st of January 2025. As you know, and as Russell has just said, Argo has a proud 75 plus year history with the clear goals of conservatively managing a diversified portfolio of Australian shares producing strong, fully frank dividends and ongoing capital appreciation, while doing so at low cost. I've been a non executive director of Argo for almost two years now. During that time, I've been impressed not only with the commitment and dedication that the directors and management team have in delivering on these goals, but also the careful thought and effort which goes into providing you, our shareholders, with a high level of service and communication about the investments market Argo's results and what Argo is doing via our website, email communications and our nationwide in-person presentations. I can assure you that your interests and those of all Argo shareholders are always front of mind in all the discussions and decisions of the board and management team. I'm looking forward to chairing the board of this great organisation through the next phase of its life and ensuring that we maintain this commitment to achieving our goals and providing great service to our shareholders. Finally, on behalf of my fellow directors and the management team, I would like to thank Russell for his commitment and diligent service to Argo as a director for the last 13 years and for the leadership he has provided as chairman over the last six. His knowledge, 
broad experience and wisdom and the open and generous style with which he shared those have been greatly appreciated by everyone and will be sorely missed. We all wish Russell every happiness and success in whatever he decides to do next. Thank you and good morning. Thanks, Peter. Uh, the poll will remain open for a short time after the meeting to allow you to submit your votes as you leave. Uh, we will announce the results of the poll to the ASX later today. If there's anybody who requires any assistance in filling out the voting papers, please don't hesitate to ask one of the representatives of Argo or Boardroom uh, as you leave. Uh, I declare this 78th annual general meeting of the company closed and I now invite you to join us for refreshments outside. Please make your way out there and look forward to speaking with you. Thank you very much for your attendance today.